Hey guys, NJ here. So today I thought we could chat a little bit about uh, tuning and rates. Now, I haven't really talked about tuning for a very long time. I did it um, quite early on uh, in the channel. And uh, every time I felt settled enough to start really talking uh, a greater depth about uh, tuning and how I, go, how I approach it specifically, the goalpost move, obviously, as we all know, uh, beta flight moves just so incredibly quickly. I mean, all of them are moving fast, whether you're, uh, you know, whether you're doing kiss or race flight, or they're constantly being developed and updated and made better. And beta flight in particular have done some pretty radical things um, with great results. They've got a great team, and uh, I think those uh, those of you that fly beta flight, especially the latest one on four, will know. Uh, just what the results of that are things are getting better and better one thing I have mentioned before um, when I've talked about this on one of the podcasts I uh, regularly attend which is LDO let's drone out that's uh, its own channel every Thursday night at 8 p.m. I'm usually on there if you want to uh, subscribe to that you'll catch me chatting about all this stuff more frequently um, but one of the things that I talk about quite a lot on there is the fact that the tuning envelope is just so large now whereas before um, you tend to find that or you, what you would find with the really early stuff and we're going back maybe five years maybe even more than that was that the tiniest little incremental change could make or break a tune completely whereas now you'll find that when you set the defaults up and you really start moving the numbers around in a kind of meaningful way like meaningful numbers like moving things up by 10 or 15 or even 20 those are those are big jumps big increments to be messing around with things it won't have this enormous detrimental effect whereas in the early days you could take that straight into a place where if you did it with derivative certainly you could immediately smoke a motor you had to be you had to be a lot more clued up you had to be really uh, on the ball and know what it was that you were changing in order to look after your gear um, all that being said there are still the the fundamentals of PID tuning the PI and the D proportional integral and derivative are still largely representing the same things as they were back then so that's probably the first thing I want to talk about which is um, and this is always such a subjective thing when it comes to freestyle which is obviously the main thing that I do I can't speak for races and I don't race I've dabbled with it a little bit but I just get too much floods of adrenaline just uh, it's not for me but uh, when it comes to freestyle it's such an incredibly subjective thing as to what you think feels good some people like the sticks to feel really loose and like that kind of spongy feel where the quad kind of reacts like a boat um, and if you're into cruising and more gentle freestyle that might be the way that uh, you you want to go for me I tend to like things to be very precise um, and I like to feel very very connected to my quad um, I think that's one thing that's generally kind of uh, a collective mindset is that you don't want to feel like you're not like you're doing things on the sticks you don't want to feel like you're doing one thing and the quad is kind of just taking forever to do it and it's kind of doing its own thing and it, there's just that lack of connection there because really what you have there you've got no direct control over the quad you're talking to the computer and the computer is telling the quad what to do so to get that kind of organic feel I think is a really important part of the art of freestyle of you being able to express you know and uh, and flow and and all these words that we associate with freestyle that all comes from you being able to feel like you are directly connected to the quad this is one of the reasons why i fly with uh, the crossfire at the incredibly low latency not everyone's sensitive to that i certainly found when i moved to crossfire i really noticed that direct connection so i always go with the lowest latency that i can uh, i've used a complete digital end-to-end -end system uh, with hall sensor gimbals and um, that is on the uh, nirvana i've been flying that now since uh, the early review model was was sent to me i've just uh, that, that's a subject for another day we'll get onto that but yeah i like to have a very low latency setup as low as possible because I find, find that all those things help. Now in terms of that direct connection to the quad this is uh, probably 
the most important thing for me initially to get right from a feel point of view um, and that is the P's the proportional so what what that is doing essentially or what that's representing is your direct stick connection so when you move the stick how does the quad feel does it feel like it's reacting nicely is it sharp if it feels incredibly spongy um, the chances are that your proportional is just too low. If the quad feels really wallowy and it's just not doing what you're doing or it, you just feel like there is that disconnection, it's the proportional you need to go after and I always suggest you go after that first anyway um, because that will be that first point of, of feeling like you're tightening the spanner a bit and everything's starting to get connected. Um, and the beta flight defaults, um, I know there are a whole ton of, uh, there's a lot of information on the beta flight tuning uh, tips page where they will give you a load of presets to start off with. What I tend to do and what I found has worked better for me, to be honest with you, because this is a, a fairly subjective thing, is actually just to, to not worry about all that to start with. Just fly the defaults, don't change anything. Um, and see where you are first before you start messing around um, with the kind of the nuance of, of filtering and tuning and all that kind of stuff. So start off with the defaults. Now I have got a flight to show you at the end of this um, this chat where I'll show you the result of where I ended up with my tune. I did it across about four packs. Um, so there will be something to, to kind of reference. But what I'm not gonna do is show you my numbers and I thought about this and every, you know I get it's probably the most commented thing I get on this channel is can you show me the PIDs for that flight can you show me the PIDs for this yes I can but look here's why I don't think I should um, there's there's a few things if we want to go in on this a little bit deeper if I was to have uh, for instance you guys probably know my main freestyle rig is this guy it's the halo v2 archon which i absolutely love to bits uh, uh chris over at halo has just done an incredible job um i gave my little sort of 10 cents here and there i had probably a lot more to do with the first version than i did the second one chris just sort of surprised me and said i've come out with the second version and i can't fault anything on here it's just been an absolutely brilliant uh frame to fly um, but if you were to give me five of these in a row and build them identically, they would not tune up the same. I might have a ballpark figure to be able to put across each one of these identical setups, but when it comes down to it, it goes a little deeper than that because every frame will have its own natural resonance and the tolerances required um, would go into the millions in terms of tuning and uh, machining and balancing to actually get all of these parts. I mean, this is why things like general aviation parts cost so much. You look at you know any of the single parts that go on to a commercial airliner. It's because the tolerances are insane. You know they're 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 balanced on to an incredible degree, and you know this is why a single bolt could end up costing hundreds and hundreds of pounds just for just for one tiny little component because it's not just your standard bolt that you go down the hardware store and buy. And we're not at that level. Yeah, sure, you get great pieces of carbon and you can get, you know, like the, the Halo stuff is is cut with Armitan carbon. It's, it's great carbon. And there is obviously a level of consistency in the manufacturing, but that doesn't uh, account for things down on a level of vibration and oscillation from the material properties where um they're going to be able to cater for that but where the flight controller will notice the nuance especially with uh the, the kind of how filtering works now and the sensitivity of the gyros and all those things so it's it's really um it's really important to try and approach tuning as every quad no matter how similar and if, as i said if i've got five identical ones they're all going to vibrate and resonate at slightly different frequencies they're all uh you know every part every time you add a part to that it's changing its resonant frequency um and those things and there are there are some quads you put together and they just fly like a pig and you can't put your finger on it and it might just be one nasty frequency that happens to be the, the frequency that you know something to do with the particular props you're running might cause an oscillation in the frame uh, you change your props and suddenly the whole thing's cured there's so much to mess around with um, and of course I understand why it's frustrating but this is 
even more important um, and why I'm constantly stressing this, that you learn to tune, that you do this yourself. Uh, going back to what I was saying, that envelope is so wide now and you can move numbers around meaningfully without causing detrimental effects, uh, you know, within reason. But as I said, that tuning envelope is wide. So don't be afraid to change things. Uh, this is also part of the problem because a lot of people I know personally who've said to me, I load up beta flight, it flies pretty good and I'm kind of scared to touch it because I don't want to make it worse. So I just go out and live with it. Um, so it's a bit of a double-edged sword. On one hand, it's you know just so easy to work with from a from a, a point of tuning, albeit a little bit overwhelming with the amount of stuff that's in there to tune now. Um, at the same time, it can kind of give you the fear, and I'm sure some of you are quite happily put your hands up and say, "Yeah, that's me," and you're too scared to touch anything on there. Um, in fear of kind of messing stuff up um, so as I said this this really could go on this video but I'm trying to keep this as concise as I can and still give you the information that I think you should know um, so <clears throat> in terms of the proportional that's what I go after first and I know roughly where I end up with my quad at the weight it is um, from working with you know this particular weight and running with the same frame consistently I know roughly where those P figures should be but the main thing is to keep moving them up until you get a sharp stick response and still th until it feels like that connection between you and the quad is there uh, when you're moving quickly from left to right and stopping does it feel like I mean don't worry about any flutter at the end that's derivative that's towards the uh, you know we'll worry about that afterwards but from the point of your connection to it it's movement to your movement does it feel direct does it feel connected that's what you're chasing with the proportional now the other thing to mention if you're running a frame like this um, there is more weight across the pitch axis loading the pitch axis generally speaking on most quads um, than there is weight uh, across the roll axis um, and that is because it's all to do with how much how close the weight is to the center of that rotation um, and on the roll axis when you're rolling you've got all of the weight along that actual axis so there's not an awful lot of loading there in other words there's less weight for the quad to actually have uh, there's less uh, weight and inertia and resistance for the quad so that's why when you tune most of the time your roll p figures uh, and d figures will generally and i to some extent will also um, be uh, a lower figure on the roll than they will be on the pitch on the pitch axis because it's rolling a, a, along this axis like that obviously there's weight that's out from that's further out from the middle of that axis and that has its own weight and uh, the obviously the further away you take it from the center of that point the more thrust is required to push it and that's why you tend to have higher numbers uh, to deal with that so it's generally speaking pretty normal to have your figures where your pitch is uh, your pitch numbers are higher than your roll numbers and that's why uh, some people offset this by running the battery in a toilet tank configuration which is having it this way across and that does something to negate uh, that I don't personally like that the Archon actually has two holes in the top here uh, which you can kind of see here and here um, and that is so that you can actually run a strap if you want to have the battery toilet tank fun fact um, so yeah um, that's why there's that offset in the figures if you're running true x and all the weight was completely in the middle then your numbers would be more kind of even across pitch and roll but for the majority of us that's why there's a difference um so the base flight the kind of the difference is usually about 20 points i tend to find between pitch and roll on the p's and less so on the d's um, and that kind of difference of 20 is usually about the same in the eyes uh, as well um, the D's tends to be more about five for me, five and eight, I suppose, is probably about uh, where I see the difference in uh, pitch and roll on derivative. So that kind of takes care of what you're looking for in, in P. So that's what you want to tune. When you're going out, you fly a battery, see how it feels, start driving your P's up first until you feel like that's really working. When it comes to the, uh, the item, um, this one probably bugs me more than any because there's been over the life of kind of the development of Betaflight 4 and, and some of the development of 3.5 uh, and sort of up from there, what I found was there was a lot changing with iTerm relax and rotation and, and the iTerm is super important to me because 
think of iterm as what's going on with the quad when you're not telling it to do something when I go up for a maneuver and I drop the throttle and I have the quad just hanging there and it's falling. I don't want the quad to budge. I want it to stay exactly on track. I don't want it to nod or dip. I don't want it to mess around. I want it to stay exactly where I leave it and integral plays a very big part in that. Proportional does have some part in it, which is why it's good to tune your piece first, but integral kind of does the main um uh, does the the kind of the bulk work of that um, don't be afraid to push your eye numbers high like for this one my eyes are up in the 80s um, and there is kind of different types of eye term feel as well because that's where it is now it's not just eye term just does one thing there's a, again possibly a subject to break down for another video but yeah the the eye term for me has to really look after the quad when i'm not giving a stick command on the right stick i'm a mode 2 flyer if you're wondering what that is um, and when i drop the throttle i want to see that is left exactly where i leave it so when i'm tuning for eye term that's one thing i'll do i'll actually go up I'll punch out, I will drop the throttle and I'll make sure that it sits exactly level. You don't get any of this washiness, no nodding, especially when you re-engage the throttle, I don't want to see any of this. Um, the only problem with it, uh, with tuning iTerm is the same things that you see from having a low iTerm, if you over-tune iTerm, you can get the same things happen again. Um, so there is kind of a sweet spot, but what I tend to say is they're very modest with where the iTerms are to start with crank them up um, until you feel like it's uh, locked where and being left where it's left it stays and then once you're at that point um, and you feel like it's doing its job there's no need to kind of hunt for more once it's doing its job leave that figure where it is um, once you're happy you do a maneuver one that I do to test apart from the two punch outs is actually to go up go inverted at a slight angle like this drop the throttle so I put it at a really awkward angle let it drop under its own weight and see if it can hold that angle. If it starts to fall out, then I'll start looking at the eye term tuning and see what's going on. Um, so that's what I'm aiming for with that. And then deriv derivative is kind of the last piece of the puzzle and that really comes into tuning that final 10% of your tune. And really that's where most of my time tuning is spent. The bulk of the tune is pretty easy to attain. It's the last 10% that you're chasing down that kind of minimizing prop wash. Now, let me just say one thing. Prop wash um, is when you're basically stalling the prop out. Um, the prop is just a rotating wing and wings can stall. That's a, you know, a physical limitation of uh, fluid dynamics. It, it's the same thing why some planes, if well, all planes, if you take the thrust away and put them at a high angle of attack, the laminar airflow across the top separates and it stops being di a dynamic flying thing and it starts to fall out of the sky. You stall the wing. And when you're falling backwards into air and you've got air coming up this way through the prop, you are base and especially if the prop's spinning very slowly you are completely got that wing um, rotating and not developing any thrust and it's completely stalled and when it's in turbulent air and it's trying to re-establish airflow back this way you're going to get this shaky stuff now of course the single best way to learn how to avoid prop wash is to is exactly as i've said avoid it don't put yourself in situations where you are going to get the quad falling backwards into its own into its own airflow um, it's something that's massively avoided in real world helicopters and you can end up in this thing called vortex ring state uh, you want to look that up you see just exactly how scary that is um, because what you end up what you end up doing as i said you you the quad then has to restabilize the airflow um and that shaking is just that's a physical limitation um of the physical world of fluid dynamics so uh when people say oh it can be tuned to have zero prop wash that's that's just not true it's it's not that's the fact it's not <laughs> it's happening um but what you know the modern flight controller with um the incredible work by these these devs is they're taking care of it at such high speed and so rapidly that it's kind of um it's almost difficult to even see when it's tuned really well you kind of almost don't even see it in the camera anymore and in fact the other thing which i think is
is so important to tuning and I really had to rely on this back in the olden days to not smoke gear uh, is use your ear your your motor when it sounds bad it's really pretty obvious uh, what a smooth motor versus a really unhappy motor sounds like it has kind of a metallic ringing to it when you know you've gone too far with P's or D's um, the motor obviously gets hot so make sure you do temperature checks um, but the, um, as I was saying about the uh, the prop wash thing fly to avoid it don't put yourself in a situation where you're stalling the prop out uh, as much as you can when you're when you're doing loops try to make sure they're not very kind of elliptical make sure they're nice and round so the quads always moving forward into clean air that's a great way to avoid ever being in that prop wash prop wash situation and i'm sure a lot of your favorite pilots you wash and they're like oh their tune's amazing they're never in prop wash i bet even with a bad tune you still won't get them in prop wash because they're flying to avoid it and it's something that you can practice um, but that said in terms of derivative and tuning for prop wash um, i know when it's good when i stop seeing it in the fpv feed uh, when i'm doing my best to put it into those situations to try and tune it um, Obviously, when I fly normally and when I do freestyle, I'm usually flying to avoid it. But there are certain maneuvers I do where you are, it will put you into kind of that partial prop wash situation. And that's why, I, you know, I, I when I'm out tuning, I do put it into those situations so that I can bring prop wash out and I can try and do something about it with the tune. Uh, and when it's good for me, as I said, you don't see the flutter, but I will hear it. But instead of being quite such a harsh oscillation it's more of a steady kind of sine wave it's it's much uh it, it sounds happier it's more of a consistent noise than it is this kind of really harsh oscillation um <clears throat> and now with beta flight four uh i've just put this on 402 uh today when i went out to tune it um you've now got the dynamic d uh which is to be honest with you, it's doing a great job. I'm really impressed. You can actually push your D figure up uh, a lot more than you could on earlier versions. And the one thing that kind of was the final piece of the puzzle was bringing my D min up by about five, maybe 10 points, just so that the D min wasn't too low, that I, I kind of set that baseline of saying, this is the minimum that I want D to be at. Um, and then it obviously it starts dynamically scaling that based on what you're doing with the sticks. Um, and yeah, it just flies so damn good now. So at the minute, this is tuned and I'll show you that flight shortly. Um, I just had four packs. After I've done my four packs of hitting those things and, and really going for it, in this in this video you'll see I'm just doing maneuver after maneuver. So, you know, watch watch this before you have your lunch. Um, but I'm hitting everything as hard as possible, being as aggressive as possible, just so that I can see the real extreme edge of any of the maneuvers that I like to do and how the tune will respond to it. Uh, I now feel like I've got this pretty sharp. There's still probably another 5% to do, but the kind of final stage for me is actually, um, because the quad's not always near me and I don't use an earpiece and a microphone like someone like Mr. Steele does, um, the last part for me is to actually review my GoPro footage to turn the audio up and actually to listen to the quad during all those maneuvers and use my ear and decide well where do I think D especially D term for, for me that's a real ear tuning thing um, wherever that is um, once I've listened to the GoPro footage that's something that I'll then adjust at the desktop and then I'll go out and test it I may even do a second set based on what I'm hearing and put that on PID profile too. Don't forget you've got the profiles. You can always, if you know you've got a good flying profile, keep it profile one, profile two and three, start experimenting with other things. Um, that makes things nice and easy for you. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my, I know this has gone on for a bit, but this is information that I think is, is hopefully useful to you. And as I said, I'm not gonna show you the numbers. I want to encourage you to go out. And even if you've been flying the same quad for a while, you try hitting your tune now with bait flight force as good a time as any to actually take advantage of all this hard work the devs have put in and start pushing your tune because once you're super connected once it suddenly clicks and everything just feels great um it, that's that's like you'll see your flying suddenly really start to progress because suddenly you feel like you can take more risks because you know close to the ground you can move you know when you snap out of that maneuver you know it's going to do exactly what you tell it to when it's tuned well if you haven't got confidence in it doing that you're going to avoid things that you might otherwise do um so yeah 
that's that's kind of my thoughts on tuning and I, I hope that is useful to you uh, the other thing I will say if you haven't already spotted it um, I am using the new Johnny FPV props and I've got to say these are brilliant uh, generally speaking Azure props I've never really liked um, because they've had some pretty wacky designs uh, and you've got to remember prop design this kind of always makes me laugh a bit I've seen some really crazy prop designs and people thinking they're going to be the next greatest thing and I'm sitting there kind of looking at it thinking guys come on props have been designed they've been around two centuries almost now and even you know as much as like a hundred years ago when they were made handcrafted out of wood they were still had efficiencies that were in the 90s we've known how to nail prop design for a very long time and you only have to look at where all the money is in aviation uh to know that you don't see like these crazy like some of the early azure props with these super crazy angles and all this weird stuff going on i even saw props with score lines horizontally across the length of the prop like that's just going to completely disrupt the laminar flow that's the laminar flow that's over the top you separate the laminar airflow over the top of the prop and you you destroy what's giving you the pre pressure differential that gives you lift you know i can just look at some of these props and know that's going to be terrible and just pull loads of current and not be any good at all um but as i said look at old plane designs like the cessna 15 152 172 you, you you look at these old planes why don't we see crazy wacky props like that on the front of those you don't because they're not efficient like that just there is this whole thing of 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 companies going for the visual like this looks cool it will sell props are cheap people will try them out and i'm not saying that you shouldn't try out different types of, and people shouldn't innovate of course i'm not saying that i mean the, on the flip side of that argument um the, a propeller is one part of the flight dynamic of an aircraft like an aeroplane like the Cessna or, or any aeroplane um, if the prop stops turning you've still got a flying plane um, it's a much larger part of the flight dynamic of a quad um, because if they stop spinning your quad falls out the sky they're, they're everything to do with the, and they're arguably the only aerodynamic thing on a quad actually there's no argument they are the only aerodynamic thing on a quad everything else just is a big draggy mess that causes problems and that's another reason why i run skinny arms just get out of the way of the thrust and just keep thinking they're five mil thick they've crashed it a lot they're plenty strong but I, this is also why i like skinny arms and also why you shouldn't run the props have the hate designs where the props are super close to the body that can also hugely mess uh with the airflow so um you definitely it definitely helps to have the prop at least kind of uh a decent like an inch or inch and a half away from from the body of the prop um but yeah, as I said, prop design, wacky props have generally not been any good. But the prop's critical to get the most efficiency out. So um, when I look at prop design, if I can usually look at it and say, that's wacky, I'm not interested. I very much doubt that's going to do anything good. This, however, this caught my eye and I thought, well, obviously I'm a huge fan of Johnny FPV anyway and his flying style. But this looked sensible. Uh, it had you know, a slightly more tapered, uh, interesting rake to the propeller. But I thought, you know, I'll give this a go. And I've got to say, um, after flying the Dow Cyclones for probably a couple of years, this is going to be my new prop. I love it. Um, it is a little more amp hungry, but it's so crisp and so responsive. But every time you change something on your quad, you take a little step backwards in your learning and in your maneuvers. Everything feels different. So when you found something you like, you know, if you're going to start messing around with new props, try a ton because you don't want to be doing this every few months. It will take your flying backwards. Uh, you know, find something you love and then stick with it uh, and you will progress. I mean, look at people like Mr. Mr. Steele's a great example. I mean, look, he's got setups. Like he did a video recently where you look, he's flying a setup, the V1 KISS setup, and it flew, he flew it absolutely incredibly. Obviously, he's an amazing pilot, but look at how little has changed on his quad. Look at how much stuff he, he keeps and keeps consistent and that's a big part to progressing with your flying is consistency every time you change something you change kv you change your prop you change the frame the weight changes the battery changes that's got a different weight and the size of it might change the cfg every time something changes it will mess with you you change your radio you change your stick length it's taking you backwards you've got to relearn everything like all of your maneuvers again and i hate that i put so much effort into learning certain set piece maneuvers some of which you'll see in this video and um 
yeah, if you if you're gonna change a few things, just do them at once, get settled, and then just stick with it. So yeah, this is my new prop hugely recommend well i recommend it if you like the way i fly um and if you look for the same kind of things that i do in flight then uh i think there's certainly uh merit um giving them a giving them a shot you should definitely try them out so yeah i've gone and ordered a whole bunch more of these because i'm going to be moving forward with them on these uh, Zing 2750 kV props. So they definitely work well because they're a 3.8 pitch. They work well with a high kV motor. So I'm not sure, maybe a mid will be okay, but I'm finding the sweet spot is definitely a high kV on these. If they did this prop with a slightly higher pitch, maybe they will, that might suit the mid kV guys, uh, which is somewhere that I've largely sit for quite, sat for quite a long time. Um, but yes, there you go. So we've covered a whole ton of stuff and I really hope I haven't uh, bored you and I hope some of this information has been useful to you. Have a little look at the flight footage. As I said, there's me just absolutely slamming it. The other thing I did change was my rates. Um, I'll tell you what, why don't you watch this and then you take a guess at what you think my rates are now. Some of you already know where my rates tend to sit, um, but see what you think these new rates are. Uh, and put that in the, the comment section and we'll see what people come up with. And then maybe I'll do a separate video on rates and because I think that's also a very important part of the puzzle uh, when it comes to you and your connection to the quad. And if you don't have that right, that can mess with things and hold you back. So that's uh, another topic to go forward with but uh, we won't do that today because this has gone on far too long as it is uh, love you guys thank you so much for being so supportive i read all your comments and i always respond so uh, thank you for being fantastic please don't forget i have a patreon for those of you that want support thank you so much for all my current patrons and uh, yeah i'll see you guys in the next one uh...